Well, hey, good morning, church. I can, uh, I can officially say it without getting jumped by somebody's grandma. Merry Christmas. It's good to see everybody. My name is Jay. Uh, man, I get to serve as one of the pastors here. I'm just excited to kick off um, this new series. I know that, uh, man, if you came in like Melissa and her team did an incredible job out there, right? Like the Christmas season. Yeah, you can clap for them. Yeah. They were on ladders in the name of God, putting up all those. Re- and then that crazy wind came, and we were just, Lord, please protect. So it's there. Man, they did such an incredible job. Great expectations, right? Like this entering into Christmas season, I just, I want you to take a minute to just take inventory on what you're feeling right now. Take inventory um, on, on how your heart is doing. What are some of the emotions that that you are experiencing. Because as we approach this Christmas season, I think that many of us are going are gonna to do quite differently what we did last year, right? I know for me, I pray to God that we don't get COVID because we got COVID literally during Christmas. That was our Christmas present. We didn't open up a gift. We opened up an email that said positive. And that whole week, my wife and I did not get to see any family. We were quarantined in a 800-square-foot home with three of the most adorable but vicious little kids. I don't know which was worse, COVID or that. But we, as a people, we dealt with things last year that we hope that we don't deal with again. I remember that uh, last year, um, that my grandmother passed away a week and a half before Christmas. There was no real process to grieve that. I was just telling my wife, like, I don't really feel like I even grieved that. You know, for, for many of you, yeah, there's that, that, that chair that's empty now. There's that void inside of you that's empty. And, and, and I think for many of us, we're like, gosh, this Christmas just has to be better. Like, it just has to. We don't want to go back. For many of you, you don't want to go back and, and experience what you did. I mean, I think like, gosh, we're already at Christmas. Can y'all believe that? Like, it's already been a year. Already been a year. Um, I I wasn't expecting to do this, but I even feel led in this moment. Um, Pastor Mark, would you and and Andrea stand, please? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. I know he wasn't expecting. But I just, I I even think about our church. I'm just, he does this to people, I'm doing it to him. I even think about our church and where we were at a year ago. And if you just would read the stats on how many churches has, have closed down over the year. The fact that knowing Pastor Mark and Andrea, how much they pray for this church, how much they as a family even have endured in, in life stages and stuff over there. I just want to take a moment for us to honor them. So if you would just, all right, you can sit down now. You can sit down. And Pastor Tom, I don't even know where he's at. I'll, I'll mess with him the, the next service. But, but, man, just thinking about how much has, has changed over the year, if we are not careful, if we are not careful, um, we can say what we said um, what I heard a lot last year, I think I probably even said it, you know, Christmas just didn't feel like Christmas this year, right? Have you heard that saying? You know, it just didn't feel like Christmas this year. And before you start calling me the Grinch, like, what is Christmas supposed to feel like? Like, have you actually ever asked that question? Like, what is Christmas supposed to feel like? And I think it's important for us to ask this question, to get to the motivation and the heart behind this question. Because if we don't, many of you, many of us, can be more impressed with Christmas than we are Christ. 
You can come into this church and be more impressed with all the things that we've set up. And you can leave this place thinking about this spirit that we put you in, but it had nothing to do with Jesus. And I think we need to get to the motivation of why we could feel certain things about Christmas. We could potentially find ourselves more worried about the gatherings, the decorations, the presents that we probably shouldn't even have bought, right? It's like my kids still every year play with the freaking tissue that we wrap the gift in and not the gift itself. I'm like, why do we do that? Just go to the 99 cent store. Let's just get wrapping paper and let's just play. (laughs) Y'all don't even care about Mickey anymore. You just want to fight over the wrapping paper. It doesn't make sense, right? And And we can find ourselves so worried about all these other things and miss out on the greatest gift we could ever receive or be reminded of, and that's Jesus. So here's my hope today, this idea of great expectations, that we would be able to make room in our hearts, in our mind, in our soul, and be reminded of the good news of the birth of Jesus and the good news that this season brings. Because regardless of what is going on, we can always have great expectations because we serve a great God. Amen. So I want us to have a common working definition of expectations. Most psychologists and people agree that an expectation is a strong belief that something will happen in the future. That is an expectation. Now, expectations aren't always bad. However, if we don't do the hard work of understanding why we create certain expectations, I think we can be tempted to find ourselves very disappointed in people, very disappointed in our circumstances, and even disappointed in God. Think, those of you that are married, most of your arguments tend to be around expectations, yeah, a, yeah, amen, right? She's like, I just had one this morning. I was expecting to be at first service, but I'm here at second because of him, right? <laughs> like we have all these expectations that oftentimes we don't even realize and we don't even communicate them. And we need to get to the heart and understand how we have been formed as people when we create expectations, Because every single one of us deals with what is known as the expectation gap. And the expectation gap is when our expectations exceed and don't match our current reality. I'll give you an example. Many of you went into Thanksgiving expecting this right here. Right? Like, oh, man, that turkey is just, that's grilled nice. But who cuts their vegetables like that? I'm like, is anyone even eating that or is that just for show? Like there's actual vegetables on this place. Like it looks like I want to eat them, right? And that's what you expected. Your Pinterest board was looking real good. But then here's what ended up happening. Reality. How many of you lost power this week? Yeah, a lot of you. You laugh and you look a lot thinner than us because you wasn't eating. The reality was that half of Eastvale was without power. And so there was this expectation gap with what you expected and your current reality. Um, it's, been, it's been very interesting in this season. I don't know if you guys know this, but my wife and I have this ministry called Song of Solomon Enterprises. And we set people up on dates. Uh, we're at six married people um, and counting. So just, just come holler. Uh, my girl list is a little high. Gentlemen, just come, come find us. Um, but, right, like, many people I've talked to, dating during quarantine has been, and, and quarantine and the pandemic and all this has been so hard. Because, right, you're always looking at profiles of people, right? So, so there's a profile that you see of this man. And you're like, my goodness. Like, ladies, you're like manna from heaven. <laughs> you're like, this, uh, Justin, Jane of the Virgin, great show. Like, this guy is awesome, right? So you see this profile. You have this expectation. And you're like, Man, ladies, you're like, man, I'm going to make sure my nails are done. I may throw in an extra few extensions in my hair just for fun. But you're like, I am going to be looking good. But then you show up to the date and reality sets in and he looks like Shrek. (laughs) You're like, did I just get catfished? What is going on? You're like, you look nothing. Like, I just feel... (laughs) I feel so bad for people that are having to date, like that I've tried to date over the last year. People look a lot better with a mask on. (laughs) 
Y'all know this. Like the teeth just look like the Democratic and Republican Party. They both just split and they just mad at each other. <laughs> like, it's just crazy. I feel bad for people who got a date during this time. I really do. But we have these expectations and they don't match our reality. And so we create, there's this expectation gap. And on a more serious note, I think many of us have expectation gaps in our relationship with God. You know, you, um, you call yourself a follower of Christ. You've been following him. But, but your life has not turned out how you expected it. You go through seasons where stuff happens to you and you did not expect it. And so you're sitting in this gap wondering why, God. You know, many of you um, in this room, you haven't even decided to follow Jesus because there's this expectation gap of what your life will turn out to be. Or is God actually good? We have these gaps. And so regardless of where you find yourself today, how we respond to these expectation gaps in our lives gives us a tremendous opportunity to become more like Jesus. How you respond to these gaps. And so today we're going to journey together and look at a story of a man. And, and listen to what Jesus said about this man. Among those born of woman, there is no one greater than he. Jesus is talking about John the Baptist in this. There is none greater than he who has been born of woman. This is how he describes him. And so you think, man, that's really great. This guy must be awesome. But today we're going to look at a story and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dive into John the Baptist and the greatest expectation gap that he had to navigate. And it led him to ask the question that I think many of us here have asked at one point in our life, or we are currently asking right now, is Jesus truly the Messiah? The Messiah being the anointed one, the one who is going to save and redeem this world. Is he truly that? And so open with me to Matthew 11, starting in verse 3. It says, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Here John is in jail, and we find him sending out his apprentices. These are his disciples to find Jesus. And the question that he wants to know is, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? This may seem like a simple question, but this is so profound, and I have to give you the backstory as to why. From the very beginning of creation, God would create the heavens and earth. It was really good. He created mankind. It was really good. Mankind would choose to serve themselves and not God. Thus, sin entered the world. And we, even though God had every right to disown us in that moment, he still is faithful. And, and in Genesis 3, God says something to Satan. He says, I am going to send this one who is going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to destroy sin and destroy all evil. And then God makes this promise to Abraham. Hey, this one is going to come from your line. And then God makes this promise to Abraham's great-grandson, Judah. Judah. The king, this one is going to come from your line. And then in comes King David. And people think he could be the one. He could be the one. But what does David do? King David, if you don't know the story, I'll tell you real quickly. He's scrolling on Instagram. And he's like, yo, who's this girl Bathsheba? <laughs> oh, okay, she looks nice. Let me go ahead and slide into her DMs, right? That's what he's doing. David, knowing that she's married... Plots because he's trying to serve himself, falls into sin, 
And every king after that chooses sin and not to crush the head of the serpent. And so what happens is God's people get sent out away from their homeland. There's no king left. So they all get sent out into exile. And God sends these people called prophets. Some of the main prophets that, that we see in the Bible are Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. There's, there's many more. But he sends these prophets to the people. And the role of a prophet is to remind people, hey, remember the covenant, the promise that God made with Abraham. And the role of the prophet is to call out the idols of the day, the things that people are worshiping that are not God. And the role of the prophet was to have a prophetic word about this one, this Messiah that was going to come and crush the head of the enemy. This prophetic word was, 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 in, was instilling hope in people. There was something that, this, that, that God's people can look forward to hoping would come. Because at that point, it has not come. Listen to what Isaiah prophesies, what he says about this Messiah, this one. Isaiah 35, verse 4. He says, say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing with sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Later on in Isaiah 61 it says, The spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn. Whoever this one is, is going to come and bring restoration, bring retribution. Those who are blind are going to be able to see. Those who cannot walk are going to be able to walk. Miracle after miracle, this one is going to provide. And he is going to be the one that brings about vengeance. Isaiah also writes about this man who is in a desert. And this man is going to prepare the way for this one Messiah. And we find out in Luke 1 who this man is. There's an angel, Gabriel. He comes to this man, Zechariah. He says, your son is going to be the one to prepare the way for the one that we've all been waiting for. And his name is going to be John. The same John who was in prison. And in Luke 4, we see John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord. He is preaching and teaching about forgiveness and repentance, and he is baptizing people. And people begin to think, is he the one? And John adamantly denies it. He says, no, no, no. The one, that, the one that's coming after me, oh, man, that's the guy. I baptize you with water, but he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. And just like a scene from a movie, this man starts walking. And he walks onto the scene. And John immediately knows it's him. He immediately knows it's him. And Jesus asked John to baptize him. And if I'm John, I'm like, oh, Lord, like, I don't want to drop this guy. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, he has a lot going on in that moment. The one has just arrived to the scene. He knows it, and so he baptizes him. And as Jesus comes out of the water, literally the heavens, it says the heavens opened up. And, and God's voice came down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. I say and share all of that for you to understand the significance of John's question here. In prison. Why on earth would John ask Jesus if he was truly the one true Messiah? He knew from the very beginning his calling. Imagine your dad 
and mom, get this word from an angel. You're gonna, your son's going to be the one. So as he's growing up, he knows he's going to be the one to prepare the way for the Lord. He knows this. He's read the teachings of, of, the, of the prophets. He's read Elijah. He's, he's read Isaiah. He's read Jeremiah. He knows all of this. He literally saw Jesus. He baptized Jesus. He saw the heavens opened up, and he has the audacity to ask God, are you actually the one? Are you actually the one? You see, John had a purpose, and it was to pave the way for the one true Messiah. But he found himself in an unusual place. You see, all of a sudden, the algorithm of John's life shifts, and he finds himself in an expectation gap. John knew about the Messiah. He had read about the Messiah. Like John, all of the people of Israel knew about the Messiah. But here's the difference. John and the people of Israel expected they were going to get this great, conquering, political leader and warrior. But you know what they got instead? A suffering servant. They got someone who, who cared for the marginalized, who cared for the outcasts. They got someone who was willing to step in and heal people that people wanted nothing to do with. You see, to John, being in prison was not part of the plan. Quarant quarantining in his jail cell, sorry I went there, it might still be a little sensitive word for some of you. Quarantining in his jail cell was not what he envisioned. You see, this gap in John's expectation has led him to question God. And if you and I were being honest, we are just like John. We are just like John. Rather than seeing and being reminded of the promises spoken of this Messiah and how he is to set things right, rather than sitting in the reality that, that John, he saw Jesus' ministry begin, it says in the, in the start of the verse in Matthew, it says he saw the deeds. He heard of the deeds of the Messiah. He heard about all the things he was doing. So rather than being reminded of that, John was looking at his circumstances and not Christ. We have the same tendency. We have the same tendency to look at our circumstances and not Jesus. I mean, think, how many of us would have a different level of joy? How many of us would have a different level of peace if we truly sat in the reality of who Jesus is and looked at him and didn't look at all the things of the world that, that, that make us into this anxious society? Because our expectations are constantly being influenced. All of the information that you take in from TV, radio, social media, it influences your expectations. It influences the way that you look at God. And the problem is we have started to build these expectations looking for hope in these political leaders and celebrity conquerors who look absolutely nothing like the suffering servant of Jesus. But we look to them more than we look to him. And so we must understand that the way the algorithm of media and consumption and of life works is it'll keep feeding you the very thing that you're looking at. The very thing that you like, the thing that you watch, it knows if I could just get them to watch more, to listen to this more, to look at this more, to share this more, I am able to shape their worldview. John is sitting in this jail cell. The algorithm of his life has shifted. Now he's in this jail cell. He's not living out his purpose. He is to him, he's not living out his purpose. He's looking at these four walls, and then he begins to start questioning, well, this is not what I expected. 
I thought I was preparing the way. How did I get here? Is God actually good? You see where the trail starts to go. When we start looking at the way that our circumstances build expectations and not looking to Jesus, our view of God begins to be diminished. And so what does God say in response to John? I think uh, to to John's um, disciples, I think it's really significant. Matthew 11, starting in verse 4. It says, Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. Listen to what he says right here. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus is a boss, y'all. He's like, and you know, I'm going to just throw the cherry on top. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Why does he say that? I think Jesus does two very crucial things here in his response. Let, we're going to keep this text on the screen. And remember back to what Isaiah prophesies about the Messiah. Remember back to that. I read it earlier. This is what Isaiah said. And see if you see it in this text. Isaiah said the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf would be opened. There would be good news brought to the poor. We see all this in what Jesus is saying. So do you know what Jesus is saying to John? I'm that guy. That's me. I am the one fulfilling this prophecy. Nobody else up until this point has fulfilled it. But you see what I'm doing. This is already done. Look and see, here, I'm doing this. I'm the guy. So yes, John, I am the Messiah. But listen to what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that there would be freedom for the captives. He doesn't say that there would be freedom for the prisoner. Because what Jesus is doing here is he's reminding John, I'm in charge Because what John is really asking is, are you about to get me out of jail? Think about it. Jesus doesn't say that. And he purposefully doesn't include this because Jesus knows that John is not going to be freed from prison. He knows that. But John doesn't know it. You see, there's a gap in his expectation. And the loving thing God, Jesus did in this moment, was he just told John the truth. I'm the Messiah, I'm the one, and I am fulfilling this, and I will restore all mankind back to God. You see, John would later die in prison, but John fully lived out his purpose. His purpose was to prepare the way for the Messiah, and he did that. And do you know what I love about Jesus? He's fully okay with John's doubt. Right after Jesus quotes the scripture to John, John's disciples, is when he says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. Right after he responds. And many of you in this room have been carrying doubt, and you're bringing it into this Christmas season So you don't have any expectations of anything being great. Many of you have actually never brought your doubt to God because you've created this unrealistic expectation about him that he needs all of us to live this perfectly doubtless life. So you don't actually go to God with your doubt. You don't go to God with these expectation gaps. Because it's in the expectation gap that Jesus was communicating to John, I'm going to sustain your faith. John is lacking faith in this moment. And he says, I'm the one. I got this. I got this, John. And it's in these expectation gaps that we have in our lives where God is trying to birth a faith that did not exist before. God invites us into a great expectation, though, 
and we find it towards the end of Matthew. It's, a, it, it's an expectation of rest where we can place all of these burdensome expectations on his shoulders. Later on in Matthew 11, it says, Come to me, all who are weary, all who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love how the, the message version, I don't know if you rock with the message version, but sorry, rock means to like associate with, engage with. But the message version, maybe this will speak to, to, to someone's soul here. It says, are you tired? Are you just worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. It says keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Man, that sounds great. But many of you, that doesn't seem like a reality. You're burnt out on religion. You're burnt out on life. And you need to recover it. And the only way you can recover it is by placing your complete faith and trust in Jesus. Being reminded of what this birth of the Savior means. Because just like he did with John in his darkest moment in pain, Jesus will do for you. He promises to comfort us. He promises to give us rest. He promises to sustain our faith. So as we conclude our time together, I want you to take inventory on your hearts. As I said in the beginning, just, just allow God to bring to the surface what you're dealing with right now. And I, and I want to challenge us to consider two options that we have. As we enter this Christmas season, we have the option to be person A or person B. Person A or person B. Person B starts on this expectational high. And all throughout the season and often in their life, the expectations of the world, everything that they read, they see, they hear, begins to diminish the way they see Jesus, the way they appreciate the gospel, the way they notice the cross. And person B is so swallowed up by the decorations, the hustle and bustle, the, the, the crazy rhythms and pace of life, that their view of the gospel and what Jesus did on the cross is so small. Or we can be person A. And person A understands what psychologists call as anchoring. They are anchored in the reality that without Jesus being born, Without Jesus enduring the cross, we literally have nothing. We have no hope. We have no peace. And so this person builds their expectations on the fact that Jesus did something that many of us would never think of. You know, we are in this cultural season where the idol of our day right now on both sides of the spectrum is health and safety. Right? Before, people used to say, hey, have a good day. That's how we used to end conversation. Now it's like, hey, stay safe. Hey, stay healthy. Hey, get that vitamin C. Right? That's the idol of our day. On both sides of the spectrum. Who do we know outside of Jesus who literally said, my purpose is that I am going to be born so that I may die. 
so that I may die and take on all the evil of the world. And I would step, Jesus is stepping on the head of the enemy. And he took all of that on the cross. And so we don't just celebrate this spirit of of how good Christmas makes us feel. We can celebrate the fact that when we look at the cross, we understand that this birth story has everything to do with our faith. That we can place all our expectations on him. Because that is finished work. It's been done. Now God calls us to live from this faith of what he's done. Because when we do that, we could truly say what the psalmist says in Psalm 16. It says, you make known to me the path of life. Because in your presence there is fullness, not a shortage. There is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You see, person A doesn't live in this false reality that everything It's going to be perfect, that there can't be any pain or there can't be any doubt. But they live in this reality that at the end, we know who wins. And as Jesus checks into the game of life, we know what the final score is. So we can always have great expectations of him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are honored to be in your presence We thank you for Vantage Point Church, the leaders here who who try to remind us and the people that, that, Jesus, you are enough. That as we step into this season, we can have great expectations because we serve a great God. A God who literally said, I am going to be born so that I may die, breaking this barrier that we had with our Heavenly Father. And so, God, I pray that in this season, we would be honest with ourselves and see how we have these expectations that that tend to want to serve us more than God. That we follow the world's way of viewing life at times and we are swallowed by the expectations and demand that that the world has on us, which leads us to a diminished view of your work on the cross. Jesus, I pray that wouldn't be so. I pray that every single person when they step out of their seats, when they go to pick up their kids or when they go to their car, they wouldn't be impressed with with all the decorations of the Christmas. They wouldn't even be impressed with how I preach, God. I pray that people, all of us here, would leave more impressed with you, Jesus. Would you be enough? Because even when we don't see it, God, you work. Even in the quarantine and prison cells of our minds and heart, you are still working. And God, we trust you. We love you. And we pray that our hearts and our eyes and our minds would be open to seeing your finished work on the cross. And we ask this in your name. Amen.